Okej, välkomna till de här kulinariska samtalen här i anknytning till årets kock. Jag har två gäster från Sydafrika och från Kalifornien. Så vi tänkte att det här samtalet kommer att ske på engelska. Är det någon som vill ha en översättning så kan vi nog inte hjälpa till med det. Uh, okay, uh, welcome to these culinary talks. Uh, and uh, we have the chef of the year competition going on upstairs. And we have a great panel of people and uh, from a wide range of different fields. And um, from Peter Eriksson from the Miljöpartiet, Green Party. the Green Party of Sweden, mm -hmm. and Per Anders Jörgensen, who is founder and of this. CEO founder, co-founder of this amazing mag magazine called Fool, who is is made in Malmo. Made in Malmo. But yes. in English. In English. Yes. And then I have David Kinch from Santa Cruz, California. And I love skateboarding and snowboarding and surfing, as everyone knows. And Santa Cruz is one of the capitals for skateboarding. So uh, <coughs> we have other things than just culinary talks to talk about. But we do that afterwards, because I don't think this crowd is so interesting in skateboarding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I have Margot from um, uh, South Africa, yes. Catherine Franche, yeah. yeah, and uh, Chef of the Year in South Africa. Last year. Last yeah. year, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and Andreas Hedlund, uh, who is Chef of the Year 2002 in Sweden, and also made the Nobel dinner twice. Yeah. And you're very into the sustainable mm -hmm. questions as well concerning mm -hmm. the Nobel dinner. Yes. And your family too. Yes. Oh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have Helian, who is a dairy farmer. Yes. In where in Sweden? Yes, on the west coast, uh, just outside Vaba is called. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also in the board of Arla. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. And uh, so, I think I would love to start with David, and tell us a little bit what's going on in California. You've been on the 50 best list. Uh, a couple of years, mm -hmm. and you're awarded with two Michelin stars. Mm -hmm. And uh, California is very different from the Scandinavian climate. It's much better weather in California. <laughs> and David has been telling me this whole week how ripe his vegetables are and how much how much flavor there goes into ripe vegetable. So, David, tell us what's 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 going on in Santa Cruz. How's California? Um, so I gravitated to California, uh, you know, as young and as nascent a culture, a food culture as we have in the United States. There is actually a food culture in California that uh, is maturing by the years. Um, our climate is Mediterranean. Our, essentially, we have a wet season and a dry season. Uh, we have access to many products. Um, I am about uh, an hour from San Francisco, uh, but I'm right smack in the middle of Silicon Valley, which is my local client base. It's where I tend to draw. The so you have a rich my... clientele. Well, I have a, uh, a sophisticated, well-traveled, well-educated clientele. And I think with fine dining, that's very important. It's people. So who... does that affect your cooking uh, and your, your choice of product? Uh, no, not really. No. It's, you know, it, it gives, it affords me the opportunity to cook how I want and, and to, to, to follow our vision and our philosophy. And we have people who choose to, to support it, which, mm -hmm. Of course, is a big, always a big part of an equation, a business equation. Wow, I'm really looking forward to coming over to Manresa. Yeah, you're always yeah. welcome. Everyone is talking about you right now. But. Okay, Marjo, yes. uh, how do I pronounce your name correctly? It's Marjo. Marjo. Marjo is uh, grown up in Holland yeah. and moved to South Africa 20 years ago. Uh, yes, but 24. Yeah, yeah. and uh, a totally different part of the world, but still a new world country. And you have also have a great climate. Yeah. yeah, I think there's actually there's a lot of similarities between uh, California and um, and South Africa, and even though we are clearly in a completely different part of the world. Mm. Um, yeah, I arrived there 24 years ago, really at the birth of the democracy, just after Nelson Mandela was released from jail. Uh, within two months, I arrived, and South Africa had been really, um, you know, the underdog. So nothing was really good enough, and even in their own eyes, things weren't good enough. And the growth that we've had and the amazing explosion of creativity and, um, and products and, yeah, our vegetables does are really ripe Does the apartheid too. still affect your daily work? Like your uh, yes. Yeah. It does. In yeah. what way? Um, poverty. Poverty and wealth. You mm. know, you're confronted with it every day. And um, I think it's, uh, it puts your feet on the ground about what, 
what is it really all about. Um, mm. We feed um, 1,150 children every day. Well, tell us, tell me a little bit about that. What, what's it, how, how do you do that? Um, it's a project we started five years ago to involve guests in the restaurant um, uh, to to give back. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for my life in South Africa, and I've always felt it's very important to mm. to give back. I can get very excited about the best apple and um, and um, the best meat, but there's hunger around the corner, and it's little children. And um, so we started feeding with a very nutritious muffin um, that we designed and guests could get involved. Do you use baking powder? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, we got guests involved in um, baking this muffin and, and delivering it. And people started adopting a day in a year. So they would um, supply us with money to to cook uh, on all days of the week, basically. So we had a Mr. Tuesday and a Mrs. Wednesday, and mm. there's only five days in a week, and people wanted to continue helping us. And we did some fundraisers in uh, in the Netherlands and raised way too much money. I was just completely freaked out by the amount of money I <laughs> raised um, because we were cooking for 100 little children in my kitchen every morning, and suddenly I had enough to do for 500, and so it would completely <laughs> change the whole... Logistics. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, the, the core of our business. But is the, the, the muffins, are they baked in the restaurant or do you have Yeah, a we only kitchen? do a muffin on the Friday and yeah. the rest of the week really we, f we base the whole, um, the whole menu is based on protein mm -hmm. um, because that feeds the brain, mm. you know, and that's where it starts, and education. Is and the rest of your staff are Dutch or no, South no, African? No, South African, we have a mixed staff, but main, yeah, a lot of South Africans. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do now is we cook... Every day, every school day for 150 children, mm. and by 10 o'clock, our driver takes it and distributes it to the mm. to the creches, mm. and we financially support two primary schools that um, that do breakfast for 1,000 children every wow. morning. Yeah, and uh, yeah. <laughs> And Per Anders, I guess both David and Margot's stories are similar to the stories that you do in in your magazine. You all usually portrait chefs in well, regional chefs. Yeah, well, it's actually, it's not a chef magazine, I would say. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a magazine about gastronomy in a very wide sense. We might put a celebrity chef on the cover and do a story about the celebrity chef, but it has to be different. And each issue is done according to a theme. Could be a strict theme, like the last one, which was Italy. It could be below the surface. It could be origins. Um, that's how we work, and um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting way to work, and it allows us a lot of freedom, I mm. would say, to create yeah. the content we want. But it's, it's very important, it's not a chef magazine, mm. it's the, uh, the other stories that really are in, we are into, like telling about deep sea fishing, which we did two issues ago, uh, but in a way that you don't, it's not too obvious that people read and can <sighs> think themselves think for themselves. That's very important. Explain a little bit about the deep fish. I find that very interesting. What was that story? That's actually my wife, who is the co-founder uh, of this magazine, Lotta. Yeah. She's the expert who uh, yeah. did the story. So I, I'm kind of... Um, I do mainly... The but you did read the story, though. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, occasionally, I read. <laughs> no, but that's just one example. I, c yeah. I could go into other example, like the, the, for in the, the Italian issue, which mm. is uh, carrying a story about the mafia and food, the Italian mafia, and their influence on food production in Italy, which is huge. An English professor who has written quite a few books about Italy and uh, Yutani, who wrote this story, mm. which is not a normal thing in the gastronomic magazine, I would but say. But both David and Marco and, and uh, myself and, and a lot of your stories in Fool are usually have one thing in common, that's that people are cooking and look sourcing for ingredients very locally. Yes. That's what we are looking for always, I think. like time and place, I would say. Mm. It, it, it's as easy as that. Time mm. and place. Mm. If it's, if it's a, a food truck somewhere, or is it the most refined, mm. high-end place anywhere, or a simple place in Japan, it's time and place, I think. So how, Andrea, I, I find it, you also do a totally different type of cooking. You cook the, the noble dinner is for how many? To 1,350. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and uh, sourcing products locally, how do you do that? I have problems sourcing for 35 guests a night. How do you source mm -hmm. local ingredients for 
1,300 people. I think in, in, in our way of thinking, we have to, maybe if we're using 3,000 kilos of meat, maybe 300 is locally. Okay. And next year, hopefully 400 kilos is locally grown. Mm. Uh, so we can't just put the name of the farmer at the menu, mm -hmm. but we still can make really good decisions. Mm. Uh, this year at the MAD uh, Symposium in Copenhagen, where René Redzepi uh, with uh, Lucky Peach this year took together some very interesting speakers. You were there, David, mm -hmm. and talked uh, with, and you brought your farmer mm -hmm. uh, with you to the talks. Yes. And uh, we have a farmer here as well. Yes. And uh, I've, uh, I've, I, I didn't listen to it myself, but a lot of my chef colleagues said it was very interesting how closely, how you first started off trying to grow your own vegetables, but then after a while you figured out, well, I'm not, uh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a farmer. I'm not, I'm not I, 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 can't, I can't do this. So you hired her or, or you? Well, she was originally a, a champion tomato grower. And she's a champion what? tomato grower? Yeah, actually, there's Do we have championships in tomato growing in Sweden? <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> she actually, she's, she's, she's created a couple of varieties of tomatoes yeah. that uh, she has the opportunity to name and patent. Oh, wow. Yeah, but uh, um, her name's Cynthia, Cynthia Sandberg, yeah. and uh, she was a champion tomato grower. She supplied the restaurants. I very naively thought I could grow vegetables, <laughs> including running a restaurant and what, in free time. I have no idea, but... Uh, um, uh, but you have such a nice climate. It shouldn't be any problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, time and... Yeah, With time. Time. Yeah. And she offered, you know, we made a commitment. She offered, uh, she offered to build what was a small garden. It was about an eight, one and a half hectares at first for the first three or four years. And it started off small, and we grew together. She just recently moved to uh, an 11 hectare property. Mm. Uh, it's all biodynamic. There's over 250 different cultivars of mm. fruits, vegetables, herbs, uh, chickens, goats, uh, supplies. Uh, uh, we make our own cheese for the restaurant. We make our own butter for the restaurant. Wow. It supplies the majority of the eggs. And this is 12 months out of the year. And it is an exclusive relationship. And she's very ambitious. She has turned the farm into a sustainability center. Uh, I am not her only Clients. revenue source. Okay. She teaches a lot of classes. She teaches maybe, she has 140 classes taught mm. a year on the property, mm. which, um, help sustain the farm but mm. you know in uh, we both made a commitment to biodynamics uh, not as a political statement but as a uh, quality statement mm -hmm. the reason why uh, we did this was not to make some sort of locavore statement but it was a statement about quality wow. and, and more control ultimately mm. it's about more control yeah. about what comes into the kitchen um, but there's a lot of diversity there yeah. uh, th there's animals there's a diversity of uh, products uh, Guests at the restaurant mm. uh, are all constantly requesting a visit to the farm, which is really only, wow. only a 15 minute drive from the restaurants. And of course we compost back. We, mm. we, you know, all the compost goes back. So there's a closed circle. There's a closed circle going on Perfect. between the restaurant, the guests and the farm. <laughs> and really, truly, uh, I think, you know, Manresa, you know, it's an ambitious restaurant. Uh, um, you know, we work very hard at being good but I really think that we were just another restaurant. And it was the start of the relationship and the growing of the relationship Made you with Love Apple Farms yeah. that, that took us to a different yeah. level. I would love to get in Peter in this conversation because as we know, the opposition has, is leading in the polls. Mm. So we might get a new government uh, this fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cooking in, in, here regionally in Scandinavia is doing fantastically well. Mm -hmm. We have a great reputation uh, abroad. Uh, the restaurants are booming on the 50 best list, uh, the Michelin stars are hailing <laughs> and probably will get a three-star restaurant this spring. Uh, that's the rumor in, uh, at least. And uh, still the, the opposition wants to hire the VAT and raises the taxes. How is this possible when we're doing so well and we want to make the restaurants more sustainable? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, actually, uh, in the last uh, election campaign, 2010, I was the one that proposed lower VAT on, on the restaurants and so. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, but then we lost the election and, and the government uh, made it. Yeah. So, so uh, they took your glory. They took uh, my, <laughs> yeah. not my suggestion and, and I, I'm not uh, depressed for that. Um, no. I think that's very good. The book. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but the, 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 I, I, uh, 
uh, focus quite a lot, and the Green Party did uh, the last election on food. And, uh, and then it was, uh, uh, the, the, the main focus was what are we giving, what kind of food are we giving to, to uh, the elderly in the elderly care and, and also the children. Because in Sweden we give every day three million meals in our public uh, restaurants or kitchens so to, to, to elderly and, and children. And, and uh, unfortunately, very much of this is crap. And, and it's coming from industry, half-fabricated, bad uh, uh, raw material. Mm. And, and um, I think uh, the, the most important thing is to make the shift to local pr production and local uh, restaurants to, to, to make the meals. So mm. uh, uh, that uh, you, you could have a, a chef and, 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 uh, and normal production close to where, where the children and the elderly are. Mm. Today, actually, quite a lot of elderly is starving because they are not eating the crap they are given. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, so what's the answer, though, on the opposition proposal to hire the VAT and raise well, the... Well, I, uh, uh, I hope this will not be the... Uh, and so you'll help us out there? Yeah, yeah, I, I try to help <laughs> you know, in, in this case. That's a promise. I have loads of witnesses here, so... <laughs> uh, it, the, to get the industry in, Helen, you're, you're a dairy farmer, but yes. you're also on the board of one of the largest mm -hmm. dairy companies in Europe, yes. Arla. Uh, and uh, how, how does that go? To, how, how do you do that? How can you be a dairy farmer and still be on the board of the largest dairy company in Sweden? Yes, it's quite easy, actually, because we, we are a lot of small farmers who has the benefits to be able to work together to do more things with our milk because... It's not so easy to sell. On my farm, I produce 6,000 liters milk every day to sell on, at the road to people. But if we are a lot together, that, that's why I have a question to you. What do you see locally? What's that? Dairy, I would love to see locally. <laughs> yes. All the dairy goes to yes. Arla and produced creme fraiche with chili yes, flavor. Yes, but we are yeah. lots of, lots of <laughs> local farmers. Yeah. If you are my farm, I'm very local where I live on the west coast of Sweden. Well, I would love to have a dairy farm where I can go and pick my milk up. I, I, I can't get one. It's really hard to source, uh, especially dairy products locally, because large companies like Arla buys a lot of the products straight from the farms. And the same thing goes with meat, both pork and uh, beef is bought by huge companies like Skull yeah. and the industry. And so. that's the good thing, because that's How why... How can that be a good thing? Yes, yeah. because that's why you can keep the farms in Sweden. Because we can't survive... I, I, I really if you, need an explanation if you, on that. You, if yeah. you just want <laughs> to come to me and buy uh, some liters of milk, what should I do with other milk? But sell it to us. Uh, yes, all of the milk, you see. And then we have that we must feed, you said, Peter, three million people every day. Mm. And you talk about children who don't have food. We, we have but that's a a two totally different questions. No, you have the no. regional questions and then you have the global questions. No. I, I was thinking more... I, I, that's I'm actually the not the turtle, uh, uh, uh. because we must have the food. Mm. But I've talked to, to lots of dairy farmers who basically grew bored of them, thought of them, th their entire production going straight into powders. That I don't know what percentage of the milk farms in Sweden are, are, are made into milk pow powder, but you probably know the percentage. No, but in Sweden it's not so much. It but but most a lot of dairy farms fresh think dairy products in Sweden. Okay, and uh, so, but, but why can't you source dairy products locally, like you do in England and? Yes, but we do, uh, on some places we do, on, on Öland now we have a, a local cheese, mm. and where I live we have Kvibele cheese. Mm -hmm. if you, if you so is Arla there, helping I out with this now? Yes, we have done Kvibele cheese, we have had for lots of years. Wow. But yes. Niklas, don't mm. we need the whole range from big producers that supply a lot of, of, of uh, customers to small really, really good producers that gives you, you exactly what you want. Yeah, yeah probably. And uh, Margot, you, you rent the cow. <laughs> <laughs> she solved the problem. <laughs> Did you have similar problems well, that I yeah, have? Sourcing yeah, we, uh, dairy? Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the, I'm, uh, we are an hour outside Cape Town yeah. in, the, in the farmland. Obviously, we have a lot of grapes growing, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of cows. And all I wanted was real milk and real cream that hadn't been through some humongous process. Mm. And um, 
it was really difficult. And I tried to have a cow in the garden of the owner of Le Cartier Francais, because she has you a had big a, you garden. You tried to have a cow outdoor? Yeah, out, outside uh, yeah the restaurant? I said, you yeah. your children have left home. Can we put a cow in your garden? <laughs> <laughs> so that we and we'll have chefs that can milk it in the morning and milk it in mm. the evening. And she was not keen. Mm. And uh, a farmer friend was also not keen to have just one cow that was mine. So eventually I had a, um, a small, there's a small cheese farm with um, Jersey cows. And every Thursday she would come to the restaurant and say, please, just, you know, just a couple of liters of milk or a couple of liters of cream. And she'd say, oh, no, mm, uh -uh. the husband makes cheese and it's holy, basically. It all goes to um, the cheese. So I, I'm not very good at um, giving up. So every Thursday I would say to her, come on, Petrina, give me some cream. <laughs> and she would say, no, Rob won't go for it. And then the one day I said to her, I have a plan. I won't buy it from you. How about I adopt a cow? Okay. And I think she was completely taken aback. Yeah. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> uh, I said, tell me what it costs a week to feed the cow, and in return I get my shares in milk and cream. And so, you know what, I buy it. I buy it from her now. Yeah, but, but it was about pushing yeah. it and saying, I'm really serious, and I can't go buy cream and milk for everything I do, um, but I certainly get the it cream that when we make the butter Quite a big from. quantity. Can yeah. I rent a cow from you, Helen? Yes, of course. Yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like um, um, it's it's more about competitive pricing. You know, you know, a small dairy. I would imagine a small dairy farmer, uh, you know, concentrates on quality. But you know, the people who can afford to pay for that, yeah. you know, you know, uh, the so-called elite, you know, elite mm. restaurants, they can't sustain an uh, you know a small dairy farm. So, mm. uh, and it's hard to compete on a on a on a large pricing basis. I think that's what. Uh, part of what you're saying? Mm. Is that I correct? I guess it's but part of it. But, but that's, that a very, that's a very interesting question, though. Why is it expensive sourcing products locally? Why is it more expensive for me to buy my milk directly from you than buy it from Arla? Oh. Is it? No, no, Will that's my question. <laughs> yeah. why, why, why would it be? Why do, you need to why do you need to sell your milk through Arla? Why can't you sell directly to the schools or the restaurants yes. or the elderly? Yes, of course I should. Uh, but I need a quality system, mm -hmm. and that's when i working with, um, if you think of the animal welfare and all things around that, you need, I need to sell all my milk. I can't just sell uh, a little of it, because mm -hmm. then I can't survive uh, economic. But what I'm saying... What's we, the turnover we need on your... Just yeah. like Andreas was into, we need yeah. both. I don't see that it's a competition between uh, small scale and large scale. We need each other, and that's a problem because we don't realize that it's important. But we there have is both. But but today, how many small dairy farms are there left? I think I uh, have quite a lot in Sweden mm -hmm. because is it growing? We, is, we are a big country, mm -hmm. so we, we don't have the resources just to have big farms. Mm. And then then when they go together, they can be able to produce milk. But what percentage? Is, is small scale dairy farms who sell who doesn't sell to Arla? How, what percentage of the farms in Sweden don't sell to Arla? Yes, but we have. But how many? How many farms out of yes. out of a hundred farms? How many don't sell to Arla? But but in average, uh, we have other dairies in Sweden too. Mm. It's not so most the dairy farms. Arla. Most dairy in Sweden produced goes to Arla. Yeah, no, or other dairies. And uh, other dairy farms. Yeah, so very small percentage mm -hmm. is uh, small scale dairy farms who sell directly to their client. Yes, very very small part. Small, yes, yeah. and often then they have uh, lots of cows. They are not small farms. Mm. Then they are mm. big farms, just like mm. you are saying. Mm. Then they need to be having volume. One of the things that we've seen in the United States, which is quite interesting, uh, very similar to what you're talking about, are, are cow shares, mm. in which uh, a group of chefs, uh, maybe in a town, uh, who can afford it, uh, they pay uh, a percentage of the output, you know, f so the, the farm can, uh, can work. You know, say there's a farm, you know, that has maybe six or eight animals, which is small, obviously, but, you know, you get three or four restaurants who work together and they make sure that there mm. is a, you know, a, a fair negotiated amount. Mm. You know, if you're paying for 20% of it, then you get 20% of the output. Mm. Um, mm. It's, it's, it's it, we, they're, they're actually called cow yeah. shares. Peter. There has been a, a shift in the, in the uh, rules right just some weeks ago so that uh, today 
it will be easier in the future, it will be easier for a school or for a, a small town to buy directly from the farmers. In what way will it, it be? Like what? In what way will it be easier? Because the rules are, are shifted so that you have to, you can take in other things like if the if it's produced locally and uh, uh, quality measures more than just the price. Mm. So that it's been a shift in the European r rules. Mm. The European Parliament actually made some good things there. Mm. And uh, how do you work with sourcing locally products? In you were telling us about the beef and, and the dairy. Do you work directly with Arla or do you source from smaller dairy farms as well? I for the big dinners? I, I think uh, like most of the, of the restaurants in Stockholm is a percentage of the, of the you know, if I open my fridge, it's 95% of all our products. <laughs> yeah. uh, they are really good enough and, and good for cooking. Then there's small diaries who uh, get me some cheese or, or special butter that I use for special dishes. But 95% mm. is from, from, from uh, the big producers. Uh, mm. And I think the big producers are starting to be better of, of developing new <coughs> products uh, and, and start to grow more locally as well. Mm. But Arla, for instance, we live in the very south in Malmo, so we have access to the Arla, the Danish market, which is different because I think Arla Denmark is way more progressive, way more interested in artisan produce and special produce. Like they created a special range of cheese made by small dairies and it's great cheese. Mm -hmm. And I actually asked Arla in Sweden if they want to do it. No. Nope. No Actually, way, yes. we are not <laughs> interested. We yeah. have done it. If, if you say, you can hear about it. I later. emailed yeah. them. Yes. In Sweden, you said, <laughs> yes. no, we're never going to do it Locally. in Sweden. They said, well, last year. Yes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have listened Se to Seven years later. <laughs> <laughs> Is the big industry companies like Arla affecting mm. the cooking and the local uh, at in California, David? Um, I mean, there's obviously, there's large concerns. Uh, the... The big problem I see in the United States is wheat uh, and growing a wheat because wheat is a commodity. 99.8% of the wheat grown in the world is, is grown not necessarily to be nutritious or tasty, but to be able to bake product for people to mm. eat. And over the course of the past couple of but generations... But you're the guys that invented that wheat. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's, I mean, the, yeah, the... the, the Ultra refined yeah. bleached mm. flour, yeah. you know, it's an American invention. You know, uh, yes, but you saw it. You saw it very early. You know, I mean, you you saw it in France. Mm. You saw it in France in the late '60s and early '70s. You know, the so-called demise of the French baguette. You know, mm. where the baguette was such an important part of the culture in France, and bread consumption all all of a sudden started uh, declining rapidly, and people were complaining about. Uh, uh, the quality of the wheat, and you know, there it's inconclusive, but there is a tie-in with with a lot of you know so-called modern uh, ailments and diseases and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we just have had a tremendous surge on people who uh, are gluten-free, um, but the fact uh, and they can't they say they can't eat any, any kind of gluten, and that impacts how we cook at the restaurant, and it mm -hmm. impacts the things that they put in, and it ultimately it impacts. Uh, the economy because it is it, it is an, eco an economy. I mean, blanched, uh, I mean, um, bleached, ultra-refined flowers in the tankers of ships going all over the world, you know, uh, as a commodity. Uh, so there is a movement in the United States. There's starting to be an awareness of, of uh, non-commodity wheat, wheat that's actually grown uh, for its nutritional value where the brand is present. And maybe it's flavor as well, right? And it's actually grown for flavor. Mm. And <laughs> what the astonishing thing about it is, is people who are so-called have celiac diseases or are gluten-free or gluten-sensitive, they can eat a loaf of bread that has been naturally leavened with this wheat, and it does not affect them whatsoever. Mm. It does not. All of a sudden, they can eat gluten. The issue is not the gluten. The issue is the flour. Which it's type a, of flour you use? Um, we source... We, we source um, uh, non-commodity wheats. Uh, a lot of them actually are Scandinavian uh, strains. That's yeah. sort of Scandinavian and French strains. Yeah. 
Because a lot, because some of the wheat is saved there in Scandinavia. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, you can create. I mean, there's there's forty thousand strains of wheat. Yeah. I mean, if you and I want to create a strain of wheat tomorrow, we can yeah. do it. We get if, if you're we interested in in uh, the history of wheat and how it, what's going on, uh, it, Dan Barber has a great TED talk on uh, on wheat, and you can Google it, and it's on YouTube. Dan Barber has a great speech in telling us yeah. the story our, about that. Our big fight right now yeah. is that the government has just announced that uh, they're about ready to. Uh, allow GMOs, mm. uh, allow uh, genetically modified uh, material into producing wheat, which is very easy to do. It's what they did to the corn industry 35 years How ago. How do the opposition stand on GMO? Uh, we are very much against taking in GMO uh, into Europe. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and th that is uh, actually one of the core questions now when we are talking about a, a free trade agreement between Europe and, and America. And, and uh, this... Um, uh, uh, a GMO ban in, in Europe. Yeah. Uh, Does Arla the, buy the GMO Americans want to take that away. And okay. um, that's Does uh, Arla buy GMO products? No, not our company, but uh, in Sweden we are GMO free to, to the mm. cows. Mm. No. You're GMO free, yes. the whole but company. That, that's, uh, that's another question. How do we buy responsible uh, sourced uh, to our cows? How soy? do we do that? Yes, we, we are joining, it's called RTRS, that's, uh, it's a program that uh, gives us the soy that we want. So it's more than a GMO or not GMO question, it's about how does the people live, who, who grows up the soy, and, and the how is the soil after they have grown it. How is it? Not so good, <laughs> if you're not with a RTS or, mm. or another program. Mm. So th that's the big question. Yeah. Yes. But is JMO grown in Sweden right now? Any? Any products? Yeah. No. No. None. No. Okay. Potatoes, yeah, but but not potatoes but the potatoes are, are not yeah. for for mm. food for the food industry, right? It's for. Yeah, it's it's not for for you and me to eat. Uh, no, no. no. Mm. Was it for making clothes? Or? I'm not really sure. It's <laughs> just, uh, so Unfortunately, a lot of it's probably to feed animals, yeah, which, feeding uh, which is so mm. part of the chain, you know. Mm. And uh, have you been doing any pieces on GMO, Anders? Mm, no, no, not really. It's such no. a, it's such an incredibly complex yeah. subject. Yeah. yeah, most most subjects are <laughs> yeah. complex, but that's extremely. But in South Africa, there are huge farms as well, right? Yeah. Run by yeah. white. Yeah. 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 And, and the uh, white farmers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, it's, so are the debate different in South Africa than it's in Europe? Do you debate the GMO and sustainability? Um, and <laughs> so s yeah, sustainability is obviously, uh, it becomes a different subject when there's poverty, I think. Mm. Um, mm. Phew, because um, first of all, people need to eat. Um, mm and how, how does the land get treated. Um, and um, yeah, it's really about education mm. and you cannot learn uh, if you're hungry. Mm. Um, so so you if know, I buy a South African product in Sweden, like for say grapes or a wine, do I know that the, the labor of that farm is doing, are doing okay or eating in the day and having okay? Uh, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. So how do yeah. I know that? Um, sure, I, I don't know how, no. how but I mean, you know, export in South Africa is clearly our poor little rand is, uh, is not worth much. So no. um, export is clearly uh, farmers eyes light up f with export. Mm. Um, so the grapes you have here are probably a tad better than the grapes I have at home, you know, and, um, and um, well, we were talking about it like wine, mm. the wine that gets exported mm. is really produced for export, mm. like, you know, you might find a small uh, wine shop that's got some exclusive wines, but if you come to South Africa, you get a completely different view on the wine that we really produce than the wine that is exported. It's super interesting, Marco told me yesterday that when she's in Europe and looking at, at a wine shop or goes into a store, she can't even recognize the South African brands. Yeah, that, they make, that there yeah. are other brands, South African brands in Europe than there are in South Africa. Well, it's from the same farm. I always look on the back, I think, which farm, <laughs> what funny name. And in Holland, um, because I'm from Holland, they, they really sort of play with the Afrikaans, like Dutch wording, and they create separate labels for, for export. Yeah. For export, yeah. yeah. And but but California is a little similar in that sense too because you have a huge farm export, right? With, uh, with yes, fruit I mean, and, and uh, you know, California is the the supplies the 
you know, the majority of a, a lot of the fresh fruits and vegetables that are consumed in the United States. Uh, you know, you hear about Napa and Sonoma, but those they only produce two to three percent of the, the the entire wine production in the state, the Central Valley. Mm. Um, you know, the whole state are, are wine regions in various microclimates, and uh, the best wine in California it never leaves the state. Mm. You know, it's usually small is import a, a uh, big competitor to companies like Arla, for example, or in dairy farms? Is yes. imported dairy products and yeah. Yes, of course it is. Yeah, I bet. Mm. In what way? In yes. quality way or in price No, way? we live in a global world and mm. uh, you can sell the products where you want. So how do you compete with, with, the, with the import? Uh, we will have good products, innovation and our quality system and, and that we, we li like to work more with sustainability because that's very important for us because we, we farmers work with the land and to have more land, because we need to work with more land in the future, because we get more people on the earth every year. We need to have good, good land so we can grow more. Mm. And, and as, as a small farmer working with a big company, does this help you out with inventions? Like, do you have a collaboration with a... Now you're on the board. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but do you, can you work, like, collaborate with them in, in inventing new dairy products that help you out on your daily basis? Yes, if you, of course, if you want, you can yeah. talk to other farmers and do. And, and if you want to do a product on your farm, you can do that, and then Arla collect the milk that's that's the rest, the rest of the milk that's on the farm. So you can do if you want to do a cheese on the farm, you can do that, and then Arla collects the other milk. But do, so do Arla help you out with uh, inventions and and uh, education as well? Yes, it, we are corporate, corporate, and then th one of the uh, basic things is education. Mm. <coughs> okay, that's about wraps it up for us. Is there anything else anyone would, Panders? No. 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 <laughs> I, I, well, I think when I hear the word was good enough, that's a problem for me. Yeah. So if we we would do our small well magazine, it's not that small anymore. Uh, just doing it good enough, it would not be good enough. It would not even be interesting. I mm. think good, good enough is a big problem. Mm. Will the opposition be good enough for the election coming up? I hope so, and that we can take some steps for more quality production and eco-production and, and have some policies in that direction. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Super nice having you here. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think the, the next uh, talkers are, will to be talking even more about products uh, it's Matthias Kron, yes, you're here. And who's else joining you? Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a whole bunch of people working with the exceptional Roavara, uh, which is a super exciting uh, uh, thing going on in Sweden where top chefs are collaborating with different farmers uh, from all over Sweden to try to be able to have the best products possible for the restaurant. Matthias will talk more about that afterwards. So thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Mo, for coming thank all you. the way from overseas.